Hey brother Hear me now Brother dog Know me Understand Welcome to the Sargasset Podcast. I'm Robbie Thigpen. I'm Francesca Elmer. And I am Mar Fernandez. And we are your hosts for today. And we are going to share with you the latest ideas and concepts about sargassum and sargassum beaching events, which have become an international challenge. Good morning, everyone. My name is Robbie. Glad to have you all visiting with us today. Um, this podcast has been brought to you by our friends at Seafields, who's doing a lot of really amazing work with sargassum and uh, carbon sequestration and whatnot. And uh, you want to check them out on the website. There's a link down here below somewhere. And I'll, I'm here with our good friends, uh, Francisca Elmer and Dr. or Dr. Francisca Elmer and Dr. Mar Fernandez Mendez and all, um, who is not related to me in any way. And, um, and we're going to be talking to this guy named Rick Lumpkin today. He's uh, down on the Rickenbacker Causeway across from Rosensteel School of all that cool stuff they do down there. And uh, we're going to be learning about more about sargassum and, and nutrient movement across great vast distances. And uh, I'm pretty excited about it today. But in the meantime, Francisca, Mar, you, you got any, anything exciting happen this week? Yes, um, for me it was an exciting week because I got to go swim in the ocean, which sounds weird living five minutes from the ocean, but the last few months were really brown. And now we are end of August, beginning of September. The water is um, blue again and you can go swimming again. We still have sargassum on the beach, but it's not rotting to an extent that is very smelly and that turns the water brown. So I'm very, very happy and have been enjoying a lot of time in the ocean. Yeah, from my side today, it was a very interesting day because I was at the Alfred Wegener Institute, which is where I will start working in October. And I was checking out all the fancy instruments they have to measure uh, CO2 in the ocean. And uh, I was thinking they have like these little things where you can just put them in the water and measure, but actually these instruments are huge and you need a lot of like battery power supply and whatever. So it was really interesting to see it. And they even have like some of them that can go down to 4,000 meters and stuff like that. So really cool stuff. I immediately got a lot of ideas on uh, how to look into the PCO2 uh, in sargassum, outside of sargassum. Um, to see how much carbon they sequester. So very inspiring, very cool. Very nice, and all. And uh, Francisco, would you tell us about our guest this morning? Yes. Um, before that, Robbie, I see you have a new chair. How can you see that? Well, I do have a new chair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, my neighbor was about to throw it out, and I said, "Hey, I'd give me that." And also, I'm gonna I'm upcycling this really fancy chair today that that we hope doesn't squeak like the other chair I had. And yes, so, we so hope, hope to our listeners, we are constantly, yeah, we are constantly improving our audio by doing little tweaks, like getting a new chair for Robbie from his neighbor. <laughs> So our guest today is Dr. Rick Lupkin. Um, he's the director of the Physical Oceanography Division of the U.S. National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, also known as NOAA. Um, and, and it's a, of the research. He's not the director of NOAA, but of the research laboratory in Miami, Florida, which is called the Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Laboratory, or AOML. Dr. Lupkin's research focuses on upper ocean processes and ocean circulation. And as the principal investigators, investigator of AOML's component of NOAA's Global Drift Program, he oversees a global array of 1,300 satellite track drifting buoys. He also helped design the ocean currents display at the St. Ocean Hall in the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History. So very, very cool person who does a lot of, lot of cool stuff. 
Welcome to the podcast, Rick. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. So thanks, uh, Rick, for joining us today. I'm a big fan of uh, the research you do and the, the papers you've written, uh, especially the ones about sargassum, of course. But uh, <laughs> it's incredible um, how you have this amazing overview and basically the entire ocean through this uh, through these drifters, uh, this drifting buoys. So yeah, today, because we're here to talk about sargassum, I, I want to start, as usual, uh, with the question, what is sargassum personally to you? So yeah, you know, for, for a lot of years, um, sargassum to me was just those little clumps of brown floating seaweed that you, I would see, you know, either on the beach and along the U.S. East Coast or uh, floating around in the water as I was wading offshore of the beach. Uh, I, I definitely remember... Um, one time as maybe a teenager finding a piece floating by, uh, maybe about hand size and, and picking it up and looking at it and seeing a little crab crawling around in the sargassum and wondering, you know, how, how, how long has this guy been riding on this? You know, where did it come from? What, what, what kind of epic adventure has, has he been on? And then, um, uh, eventually after, uh, getting my PhD in Hawaii and doing a postdoc in France, I, um, moved to Miami and in Miami, I did my first oceanographic research cruise in 2003, and that was a, a cruise where we went um, basically uh, east of Bermuda, or excuse me, east of the Bahamas, and uh, sampled in the area between the Bahamas and Bermuda, and then kind of back to the, to the coast of Miami. And that was the first time I was ever in the Sargassum Sea, this uh, Sargasso Sea. And it was really an interesting experience to see so much Sargasso floating around on the surface of the water. And... Uh, I found it really fascinating how you would sometimes see huge amounts and other times, you know, you wouldn't see a lot at all. And I think a lot of that has to do with the, the conditions and how much it's kind of mixing vertically, as well as just the fact that it kind of cl uh, collects into clumps that you can sail through one, at one time or another. Uh, starting about in 2006, I started going on uh, annual cruises where we would basically go all the way across the Sargasso Sea, uh, often, for example, from... Um, Puerto Rico to off of the African coast around the Cape Verde Islands and then back to perhaps uh, Key West or something like that. So we'd sail through the Sargasso Sea for many days at a time. And I remember distinctly seeing one morning getting up and basically seeing nothing but for Sargasso from, from one horizon to the other. Uh, just a, a amazing sight and, and it really made an impression on me of the, the huge ecosystem that we're talking about here. He sounds... Kind of like me, doesn't he? Except he's a lot more articulate. And uh, um, thank you for this. I, 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 I like this story. I kind of got two questions for you. One, the nearest uh, NOAA weather buoy is in Frying Pan Shoals in North Carolina. How do we get one off Georgetown uh, since you do something with buoys? <laughs> now, I'm teasing. I know this, that, that's not your, your thing. <laughs> um, but, you know, You've published a paper on the, the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt and how it got established. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about how it was formed? Uh, yes. Yeah, so so um, I certainly need to acknowledge all of my co-authors, including the lead author, uh, Libby Johns. Uh, she did an amazing job of bringing together a lot of different people with a lot of experience um, to examine, you know, basically what happened. Basically, starting in 2011, as, as your listeners are no doubt aware, there were huge inundation events uh, in the Caribbean and uh, Gulf of Mexico and U.S. East Coast. And there's been a lot of debate as to where that sargasso, sargassum came from. Uh, the Sargasso Sea is an obvious candidate for that, but uh, several previous studies, especially those that were looking at the drifting buoys that I'm uh, an expert in, came to the conclusion that it couldn't have come from the Sargasso Sea that it, it must have come from uh, the equatorial tropical Atlantic band uh, as its kind of ultimate source. And so that was the part of the paper that I was most heavily involved in, was to look at, um, you know, it, why is it that those studies came to the conclusions they did, and is it possible that the, that the, Sargasso, the Sargassum that's been doing these inundations came from the Sargasso Sea ultimately? Uh, we came to the conclusion that, yes, it, it could have come from the Sargasso Sea, and uh, it was basically uh, all triggered by a very anomalous climate event that happened in, um, in late 2009 to early 2010. There's this climate uh, phenomenon known as the North Atlantic Oscillation. And to explain it, we kind of measure it by an index. And that index is the difference in pressure from uh, the 
subpolar low to the subtropical high. So it's basically kind of between the Canary Islands and Iceland. And if the pressure gets very low in Iceland and very high in, um, in the subtropics, then we say that the index is very high. And that's associated with very strong westerly winds, which are, which are kind of blowing at the northern end of the North Atlantic. And, uh, and when it's low, on the other hand, that gradient weakens. And the winds weaken, become less steady, and the westerly shift to the south. So the really unusual thing that happened starting in about December 2009 through March 2010 was uh, the lowest, most sustained value of this North Atlantic Oscillation Index that we've seen in the historical record since 1899. So very, very anomalous conditions, which shifted this wind belt to the south, the wind that blows from the west to the east, and we believe fleshed out a large amount of sargassum from the Sargasso Sea into the um, eastern part of the, of the uh, subtropical Atlantic. And from that point on, the Sargasso can be picked up, the Sargasso can be picked up by the Canary Current, which flows southward along the uh, coast of Africa, and picked up then by the North Equatorial Current, which would carry the Sargasso westward and ultimately into the Caribbean Sea and the, sub, and the uh, western subtropical Atlantic. So this really unusual situation caused a, a large flushing of the sargassum and then led to the uh, creation of the belt in the tropical area of the, um, of the Caribbean, particularly the region of, that is seasonally north of or within the area where the, the trade winds from the north and the trade winds from the south converge, and we call that the intertropical convergence zone. Uh, and so that seasonal migration tends to, as it moves northward in the spring, uh, take the sargassum that's there, collect it into a very dense uh, amounts that can then be fed by nutrients, bloom, and then cause a seasonal flushing into the Caribbean Sea and Gulf of Mexico. So we, we believe basically from a number of different pieces of evidence that the sargassum uh, ultimately did or originate from the, sea, the Sargasso Sea. Super interesting. I, I keep on citing uh, your paper to precisely explain this story to people when they ask me where, where is it coming from? And then I have to explain all these things. And I, <laughs> I never did it as good as you did. So thanks a lot. Our listeners will be thankful for this uh, very well explained uh, origin of the Sargassum Atlantic Belt. Now, my question is more related. So this was kind of the physical story. So how it came there with the winds and the currents. And now what made it stay in terms of nutrients? Like where were the nutrients coming from so that that sargassum could actually thrive there and grow? Because I remember at the beginning when I got into this topic, there were a lot of discussions. Oh, is it coming from the agricultural um, uh, waters in the rivers and the excess nutrients? Or is it coming from changed upwelling patterns in the equatorial Atlantic? So where where are the nutrients coming from? So the nutrients we believe come from a number of different sources. And um, it, it, the thing that seemed to have really changed was creating a critical mass of sargassum in this region rather than, you know, some change in the, the, the runoff or something like that, that 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 could have triggered this event. So we believe that there was this uh, change driven by the, the North Atlantic Oscillation creating a critical mass, and then what feeds it is um, a number of different processes. First of all, uh, as I mentioned, it's uh, accumulated and um, condensed, basically kind of gathered together by the northward migration of the intertropical convergence zone. To the north of that, the winds tend to diverge, and that divergent wind drives upwelling of water. As you move water apart at the surface, it comes up from beneath, and that brings nutrients with it. Another thing that happens is that the winds themselves drive a, a mixing of the upper part of the ocean. And the upper part, which is well mixed, if you, if you lower an instrument measuring temperature or salinity, you'll see uh, that there's a long period of time where basically it's constant. And then you see an abrupt change. And that layer is called the mixed layer. And so if the winds are very light, the mixed layer gets very shallow and lots of heavy winds drive that deep. And as it gets deep, it picks up the nutrients from beneath it and then the wave action and such kind of mix those nutrients through the mixed layer. So deep mixed layers associated with these winds uh, feed the sargassum as it's condensed uh, within the intertropical convergence zone as well as those nutrients brought in from beneath to the north and uh, just diffusion at the base of the mixed layer, so kind of eddy 
eddy mixing at the base of the mixed layer can also bring nutrients in. And then finally, when you look at the kind of extent of the sargassum, you, you see very clearly that over on the western edge of where it's, where it's kind of gathered together, you have the uh, Amazon and Orinoco outflow which carries with it nutrients as well and feeds that part of the sargassum uh, belt as it's flushing into the Caribbean Sea. So nutrients are coming from all of these different sources effectively. And just a tiny follow-up question on that, if I might. Um, this upwelling that happens in the equatorial um, Atlantic, has it increased with, with, the, with climate change or this was always there and not just the sargassum is there to use it. This is a seasonal thing that's existed for as long as we know. It's uh, something called the uh, equatorial cold tongue. And it's basically, um, okay. yeah, it's, it's a result of the Earth's rotation and the trade winds uh, being present there that you seasonally, uh, you know, the, the trade winds shift north and south. And as they shift south and are basically in this uh, equatorial zone, uh, you you because of the rotation of the earth uh, in the northern hemisphere, things tend to kind of shift off to the right of the winds, the, the water being alone. And in the southern hemisphere, shifts to the left of the winds as a result of the rotation. So that causes the, the water to diverge and bring cold water to the surface seasonally along the equatorial Atlantic. Cool, thanks. Yes, that's very interesting indeed. And I know a lot of people who's, who, who tell me like, Ah, oh, we have to clean up our runoff and our sewage system here so we won't have sargassum anymore. And often I tell them it's not as easy. Of course, if you clean up your local runoff and, and sewage sy system, that's definitely a good thing and it may get you less sargassum, but it's coming all the way from the Atlantic and already starting to grow there. And some of them are, some people are really surprised that, that it has such a long journey of growth and, and coming there. Um, so the results you guys found are pretty astonishing and pretty cool that you have figured out how it got from the Sargasso Sea down to the equator. So what type of methods and data did you use to get these results? Because I assume it's not that easy to figure this out. We That's correct. We had to uh basically use a number of different lines of evidence uh, to make this argument. Um, we used uh, reanalysis data, uh, basically a product created by uh, part of NOAA called the National Centers for Environmental Prediction, or NSEP. So they produce uh, a reanalysis field of winds and currents um, and allow us to see how the uh, situation evolved through this uh, North Atlantic Oscillation event that we talk about in the paper. We, um, a co-author of ours, looked at uh, sargassum in satellite imagery so that we could see how that moves, and that really helped us to kind of see the seasonal uh, evolution of the sargassum belt, especially after it had been established. We um, looked at numerical models. So these are uh, basically simulations of the ocean that are forced by winds, and then we could, uh, a different co-author uh, specializes in this, basically put particles in the model. And what he was able to do was run the model backwards, which is really an interesting way of doing this. You know, a fun thing you can do with a, with a simulated ocean that you can't do with the real thing. So he started off in 2011 with the particles, the sargassum particles in the Caribbean, and then ran time backwards to see where it could have come from. And uh, one of the things that he found is that if you basically just use the ocean currents, uh, which in the model are, are a few meters deep, you don't find that the particles will backtrace to the Sargasso Sea. But once you include a little bit of windage, and let me explain what that is in a minute, then you find that the particles do come from the Sargasso Sea back in the 2009-2010 event. So what is windage? When you're looking at the ocean, um, and you're measuring it with, uh, for example, the drifting buoys that I work with a lot, the, the buoys are, are, are designed to follow the water beneath the surface. Uh, we really want to understand what the ocean currents are. We don't want the instrument to be affected by winds blowing on it. And the model similarly is simulating the movement of the water just, you know, a little bit beneath the surface. But the sargassum is floating right at the surface, and a number of things cause those objects to move differently than things that are a little bit deeper. You have the wind blowing on it directly to, to whatever degree some of it is actually extending up a little bit beneath the surface. Um, but in addition, there are other more subtle effects that happen. The wind creates waves, 
And if you ever look at a wave moving, you see that the motion downwind at the top of the wave is bigger than the motion back upwind at the base of the wave. And so an object floating right at the surface will tend to move along with the waves, generally downwind. This is something called Stokes drift. If the waves get big enough, then you can actually get breaking waves, which can cause an object to surf. And if you've been out at sea, you know, obviously at the beach you see waves breaking, and that's what's pulling those particles, the sargassum, right onto the beach very quickly. But even out at sea, and, uh, and fairly moderate to, to strong uh, wind situations, you see waves breaking. And so that wave breaking can cause a surfing of particles floating right at the surface. And then there are even more subtle effects, uh, such as um, the, when the wind blows, it can set up rows where objects can tend to converge and then move more quickly uh, downwind. And so all of these effects cause an object floating at the surface to move more quickly than something beneath the surface. And uh, that ended up being really important to show that the particles could have come, or that the sargassum uh, could have come from the Sargasso Sea using these particles in the model and in the data that I analyzed, which was the drifting buoy data. So previous studies had concluded that the sargassum couldn't have come from the Sargasso Sea by looking at these drifters and, and following them backwards, you know, basically saying, where did the drifters come from that ended up in this region? And they excluded drifters that had lost their drogue. A drogue is a sea anchor that's centered at 15 meters deep. It's a big, huge, it basically dominates the area of these instruments. And we typically re remove the data from the ones that lose their drogue because at that point, they're no longer f really following the currents at 15 meters deep. Now they're bobbing at the surface, they're being blown by the wind, they're experiencing this windage that I talked about. But if you're thinking about things floating at the surface, that's precisely the data you really want to be looking at and not neglecting. And so it, it's kind of, it's really an interesting thing that I've, I've seen in, in the last about 10 years is people going from seeing the data from these drifters that lost their drogue is, you know, well, that's junk now for currents. We can't really use it for currents anymore. To realizing there's a lot of value in these data in terms of uh, understanding not just Sargasso, but, um, uh, where marine debris goes, for example, as well. So there's a lot of uh, additional value in these data that we used to regularly discard. So in this paper, uh, what I did was to separate the drifters with drogues and without drogues and separately analyze those. And I was able to show that indeed for the drogue drifters, if you kind of backtrace from the, from the Caribbean Sea, you find that uh, as previous studies had concluded, yes, it, it, it couldn't have come from the um, Sargasso Sea. It had to have come from the equatorial tropical Atlantic region. But the ones that do, do not have the drogues attached, the ones that were just bobbing around floating at the surface, very much could have come from uh, the region, uh, basically um, climatologically, so using all of the data, you can definitely see a pathway that goes straight to the region that is east of the Sargasso Sea. And so that helps us to connect the dots. Well, if this Sargasso was flushed from the Sargasso Sea into this region in 2010, it would get then picked up and carried by these currents exactly as the undrogue drifters are carried right to the region of the uh, intertropical convergence zone and into the Caribbean. Uh, so the, it basically, that really helped us to connect the dots and, and, and demonstrate that, yes, we think we've really conclusively kind of uh, demonstrated this is the case. A uh, final piece of evidence that we had in the paper are net toes uh, that another of the co-authors uh, specializes in. And these are actual collections of sargassum, uh, and then the species can be analyzed to show that it is consistent with the species that are in the Sargasso Sea. This is really cool. I, I really like the story of the, the broken uh, drifters that actually in the end were the ones uh, solving the mystery, right? The ones that no one was, was looking at. And that also remind me, reminds me how biased we are sometimes in science because we trust our methods blindly. And we think we understand what we're doing, and then sometimes we really need to to look beyond and um, and look at the broken the broken ones. So that yeah, that's an excellent excellent story. And yeah, is it also the wind that explains the seasonality of sargassum? Because we have in the Caribbean, for example, 
a stronger influx in summer than in winter. Um, is this what it explains? Yes, definitely. It's the changes in wind and how they change ocean currents. Um, so a- as I mentioned before, as you're moving from spring into summer, the intertropical convergence zone is shifting to the north in response to the large scale changes of temperature over the um, Earth's surface. That uh, does a number of things. It accumulates the sargassum and helps to basically cause another bloom. Uh, it's associated with the, uh, with the increase and in deepening of the mix layer and more nutrients being fed to the sargassum. And it does something to the ocean, which is a kind of an interesting case that it, basically if you look at the um, coast of Brazil, there is a current that flows um, northward along the coast of Brazil called the North Brazil Current, creative name that. And um, basically in the winter and very early spring, that current retroflex, it peels off the coast and then flows back uh, into the um, into the Atlantic in a current called the North Equatorial Countercurrent, which p- tends to take the sargassum and prevent it. It's, it's blocking that pipeline that would allow it to go into the, the Caribbean Sea. But then as it shifts north, that relaxes. That, nor- that retroflexion effectively sort of disappears through spring to summer, and the flow enters into the Caribbean Sea uh, more directly, which allows for the sargassum to, in, in, the, in the western part of the belt, to start peeling off and flowing into the Caribbean, and then subsequently following the Caribbean current, the Loop Current, and the Gulf Stream uh, in that pathway back around. Cool. That's very interesting because we biologists tend to think that everything has to do with just biological seasonality and not with the currents. But of course, in the influx in the Caribbean, the currents have most, I mean, the winds and the currents have most of the importance. Yeah, nice thing. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting balance of biology and physics that's a going to be a lot of interesting future research as we look at how these things work together to explain these phenomena. I'm just, I'm enjoying myself. I haven't had much to <laughs> even think about. You know, like you, I'm, I'm learning a lot today. Thank you so much. And I'll, and from what we learned a little bit earlier about uh, the, the create, what we believe that how these things began and all that stuff, and the, uh, you know, the, the new patch down there, down south, um, you know, um, and you would think that maybe the, the new patches and these problems and whatnot are, are here to stay. And uh, what, 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 is, what is your feeling about that? It, it, that's a great question. Um, and I'll just start off by saying we really don't know for sure. Uh, as, the, as this extends on, and now it's been, you know, for about a decade, it, it seems to be very persistent. Um, and so uh, Every year that we, we still see more of this of these inundations and more evidence of this uh, sargassum belt in the tropical Atlantic being maintained, the more permanent it seems to be. We did see um, an event uh, in 2013 where there was very little sargassum, and that was because that particular year had uh, very shallow mixed layer depths compared to other years. Uh, as I mentioned, the uh, strong winds will tend to mix this uh, mixed layer depth deeper and will entrain nutrients. And we think in that particular year, there weren't very many much nutrients brought in uh, to the uh, region where it blooms. And as a consequence, there weren't a lot of inundations um, that, that the subsequent uh, uh, spring to summer. If something like that were to happen for several years in a row, perhaps, Perhaps this could be disrupted. Um, perhaps the uh, tropical belt could could basically be disrupted to the point where it's no longer at a critical mass. And that's pure speculation. Um, it's possible too that uh, there were, uh, you know, maybe hundreds to thousands of years ago uh, events that that caused that were similar to the NAO event that we saw. Uh, in 2009 to 2010. So it may be that in the distant past, this uh, belt may have periodically formed and then eventually dissipated through various processes. I think to answer the question, we're going to need to have coupled uh, models of uh, ocean, atmosphere, and biology, and basically see what we can do to these models to basically disrupt the nutri- the sargassum belt to the point where it, it is uh, no longer a semi-permanent feature of the region. Uh, I, th- I think that's really the only obvious tool apart from having it happen and then analyzing the data after the fact to really solidly answer that question. Thank you. And uh, I'd point out that we have two uh, biologists right here that's 
very, very interested in your work. <laughs> and looking at uh, yeah, but Mars. Actually, I am more interested in the physics. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. that's the part I don't fully understand. <laughs> and so, can I ask a follow-up question about this? <laughs> because what do the models say in terms of the predictions for climate change? Are we expecting more wind creating more upwelling or, or deeper mixed layers? Or are we actually expecting the opposite because of thermal stratification? Like what would be the, right now, you know, if, if climate change continues business as usual, which hopefully won't happen, do we expect more winds or less wind in that in that area? That's a really good That's question. Nice. And, and the answer is we don't know for really interesting reasons. Um, when we take a model of the ocean and a model of the atmosphere and we couple them together so that we have each one forcing the other, which is what happens, you know, if you really want to understand climate processes, something very strange systematically happens in the uh, equatorial and tropical Atlantic Ocean. And that is that the models uh, basically shut down the formation of the cold tongue. It's something called a, a, a Atlantic Nino event. It's sort of parallel to what happens in the Pacific Ocean. But the problem is that the models always run towards like a permanent um, Atlantic Nino regardless of the forcing, uh, regardless of whether you're using like a actual annual forcing or even just climatological forcing, where it shouldn't go into this permanently kind of stuck Atlantic Nino state. It's a problem that's been kind of plaguing climate models in this region for quite a while now, and the modelers are, are very aware of it and, and working on ways of solving it. But while the models are suffering this, we are, it's difficult to really put a huge amount of faith in the, the, the regional predictions in this particular region as we run things forward in time. It's a, breach, it's a place where we, you, we need a lot more observations. We need a lot of uh, modeling developments. Uh, and there's a, even an active debate over whether it's the ocean or it's the atmosphere that's sort of leading to this permanent uh, Atlantic Nino state in the models. But yeah, it's, uh, it's, this is a great we don't know kind of question. Now, wow. as, the, as the atmosphere warms, you do expect that you would have more stratification. And so I think that, you know, that, that's something that we, we, we could see. Um, but that could be countered by, for example, if we have uh, stronger uh, tropical storms and such, you know, that, that might be a countering effect in a warmer world. But, but really, we, we don't know. And, and it's going to take some more progress before we find out. Yes, and for all the things we don't know, it just means we have to be even more careful um, than if we actually have a kind of an idea, because if we don't know, then, yeah, we should just not, not mess with it. It's the best way, I think. Um, so here in Mexico, a lot of people are depending on tourism, and the people who are depending on tourism, I at least once, probably even twice, got the question, from these people like, is there a current that can take away all the sargassum so that there's no more beaching events happening in Mexico or I guess anywhere, but so does such a current exist? Is there a way that we can just move it somewhere and then it goes somewhere else? <laughs> well, that's basically what's happening now, right? I mean, it's sure, sure, it's causing these inundations, but also it continues to be carried along this pipeline of, of uh, these currents that are, that are well-established and, and uh, have seasonal variations. But I think that you can't count on any kind of changes and uh, dramatic changes in ocean circulation to cause um, to cause uh, changes in the amount of sargassum being carried in you know i think that that we will continue to see um a, a caribbean current flowing from uh east to west through the caribbean that that then swivels to the north flows to the yucatan uh, loops around as a loop current and then becomes the florida current and gulf stream system there are there's speculation about how that may weaken somewhat if uh the great overturning uh, circulation the conveyor belt slows down with global warming but uh, that effect may be relatively subtle in terms of the strength of the currents especially through this region it uh, we it is possible that they could weaken uh, but I wouldn't count on it as, as any kind of a, a a way of being saved from sargassum inundation 
Yeah, that's kind of what I try to tell them too. But they they hope that there's an easy answer, but unfortunately, <laughs> there isn't. Right. Yeah, I think at best you can say, well, it 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 is possible, but like you said before, you don't you don't hang your hopes on something that you 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 know don't don't expect and don't know that that's what's going to happen. And it's better to to uh, to look at uh, ways of dealing with it, ways of mitigating it, and and ways of trying to predict inundation events before they happen, so that the infrastructure can be in place to deal with that. So, for example, um, my laboratory is producing experimental sargassum inundation reports that are based on uh, collaboration with the University of South Florida, looking at uh, where sargassum is in satellite imagery. And we hope that these reports can kind of warn ahead of time of places that are in danger of inundation and with uh, future efforts of being able to more dynamically model how the sargassum moves, we hope that we can actually start being able to, to do solid predictions of, of you know, how, how big the threat level is ahead of time. And so people can, you know, have bulldozers or whatever other infrastructure in place ahead of the inundation uh, and, and know it's coming to be able to, to ameliorate the uh, impact. And also for the people who want to make products, that they know that they're getting fresh sargassum as a resource. <laughs> Excellent point, right? Does anybody else have more questions for Rick? I would have hours and hours of questions, but I think our listeners <laughs> would at some point disconnect. So, um, yeah, thank you, Rick, so much for explaining things so nicely. I think our listeners will appreciate learning about physical oceanography today. Um, and yeah, you will probably hear from me in the future with some emails and more follow-up questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you all very much. It was a pleasure to be here. It was an absolute yes, delight. Thank I'm, you I'm, so I'm much. Just, I'm, I'm just gobsmacked at, at uh, your, your <laughs> the interview today. Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah, all our interviews are, you know, I learned from all our interviews, but these are things I, I, I haven't even been able to formulate these the questions that you answered today. And, um, and not just the one that she wrote, but, the, but you answered a lot more than, than, than the question we put to you. And, um, and I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I, I did enjoy it very much. Thank you all, too. Thanks for, for inviting me. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. All right. All right. We'll, 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 you'll hear from more next. <laughs> all right. Sounds good. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye. Yeah, Mar, you were very animated. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this is for me like like meeting your favorite um, singer or something like that. I've read this paper like 20 times and this is like the one paper I keep showing everyone and I try to explain what he explained today to us in really nice words and very clearly. And I, I always try to, to explain it and I never managed to do it as well as he did. So for me, it was really like meeting, you know, your favorite singer and you've been listening to these songs for the entire year. So that's why I was so excited. Yeah, well, you, you were just yes, falling um, over the map while he was explaining all this stuff and just, you know, you, you were, uh, yeah, you, you, were, you, you had a, you had a map of the, uh, of the land, of the Atlantic in front of it. I could just see you following everything around. It was great. Mm -hmm. My favorite part of the interview was the one about the the methods, the one you made. I think that's a really good question. And I, I love the part where, where he actually said, well, in the end, you know, the the um, drifters that were usually, we assumed they were broken and we didn't use them for anything. They were the ones that solved the mystery of where the sargassum from the Atlantic sargassum belt was coming from. And I think that's a that's an excellent story because, as I said before, in science, we... We tend to trust uh, our methods blindly, and uh, these things, you know, remind me that we are human beings, and that not that's why machines, you know, artificial intelligence will never be as good as scientists and human beings because we are able to connect the dots and say, hey, wait, uh, maybe we can use that data for something because actually, the sargassum is only floating at the surface and not at 15 meters depth. So that was that was a great story. Yes, I think for me, the, when he said that that anomaly in 2019, 2010 was actually the lowest they have seen since they started taking data, that was a new information I didn't know. I knew it was an extreme event, and I knew it was kind of caused by climate change, and I think it's caused by climate change. 
but I didn't know that it was like the actually extremist event that we ever had. And I thought that was really interesting and very cool. And yes, like more um, people who have written this paper are kind of superstars to me. And every time we try to think about where, when and where we can do research, we, we pull up that map they have of where the sargassum normally is in which month. So we can see like, oh, well, that month would be good or this month would be good and where we would go. So it's a very useful paper with really cool graphics in it, which I think that's what I really appreciate, the graphics they made and that they took the time to do that. Robbie's speechless again. Um, well, <laughs> I, I'm kind of like you guys, you know, um, you know, when, the, you know, there's certain people when I was uh, heavy into some of this research on, uh, you know, um, fisheries and lobsters and, and whatnot, um, I would run into somebody who's, Paper, I'd read 50 of their papers <laughs> at a conference or something. And it was, it was like I was running into a, 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 you know, Warrens of Honor or somebody, you know, was, it was, you know, I felt like um, so uh, intimidated by their presidents just to, just to talk to them. And, and simultaneously, I was extremely excited and couldn't shut up, you know, and, and I also know I, I, I understand that very, very much so. And also, I, I really uh, I empathize with your feelings about meeting this guy. And also, yeah. And if that's all we have today, we want to thank everybody for being with us. You could have been anywhere on the planet. We're in Mexico, northern Germany, coastal South Carolina, and, and the Rickenbacker Causeway earlier with our guests. Um, and, and you could have been anywhere, too, but you chose to be here with us. And we really appreciate it. We want to thank our sponsor, Seafields, for uh, helping us out with this. And and uh, we'll look forward to meeting you with a new guest next week. Yeah. Thanks a lot, everyone, for being here. Have a nice day. Yeah, have a nice day. And until next week. Thank you for tuning in today and learning with us from our guests. If you want more information about what our guests talked about today, then please check our show notes for links and information in our archives. And don't forget to like and share our podcast with your friends. If you enjoyed our podcast, please consider supporting us financially by becoming a patron. For as little as $1 per month, you can support us and get exclusive benefit of submitting questions for our interviewees before the interview. The Sargasm Podcast is produced by Marine Conservation Without Borders and is made possible with financial support from Seafields and the Kimberly Green Latin American and Caribbean Center, U.S. Department of Education, Title V Grant. It is produced by Marcel Van de Camp, Lauren Blankenship, Cleo Maridakas, Francisca Elmer, and Eloise Lopez, and hosted by Robbie Thigpen, Francesca Elmer, Mar Fernandez, Florence Menez, Cleo Maridakas, and Paula Diaz. We will be back next week with another exciting guest. The music of this podcast is from the song Dama Prey by Drizzle the Roadrunner, an artist from Roatan. Follow him on Spotify or YouTube for more music. But for now, here is the full song, Dama Prey. Hey, brother, hear me now, brother, dog, know me, understand, now for them no one be see we get nothing, that's why they my free and always front and star, now for them no one be see we get nothing, that's why they my free, now for them my free, free, they my free, they my free, me no gain progress, now for them my free, my pray me to reap success. Now for them, I pray. Pray them, I pray. Them, I pray me no gain progress. Now for them, I pray. Them, I pray me to reap success. So me tell them, yeah, promises yeah. come and me no take that. Only if it come from Jah, I'll accept that. Now for them, I put my trust in and give me set back. Yo, select that. Me lamp pull up that. Tell some wicked a bad mind. Me no fear them. Anytime them cheat and chat, me no hear them. Me dash up. Hot so body wear them, me dash a few hot so tell them where them. Now for them a free, free them a free, them a free, me no 
in progress, not for them I'm free They my free, me to reap success, so me tell them yeah Yes, me know me have a lot of fake friends But me never woulda taught me woulda have fake family yeah, So me tell them straight, me no trust them Me no trust you and me no trust him Fake friend lost, lost bad mind, mind in a real life star Me no rate that star, me no rate that uh, Me real for me woulda bust a million shot in a real life real, real, real Now real for life. them a free Them a free, me no gain progress Now for them a free I'm a me to reap success Now for them I'm free I'm a free me no gain progress Now for them I'm free I'm a free me to reap success So me tell you yeah. Life, but they might hate and grudge and creep on mine. They might move like Judas. They might move like Judas. Plus, everybody have a life to live. So, they give one rash clock. Who I try to judge me like them chit and chat. So, what them want to say? Cause none of them out there. Not nah, be yeah. them. Yeah. They might free. They might free me. No gain progress. Not for them. I'm free. They might free me. No rip success. Now for them a free They my free me no gain progress Now for them a free They my free me no rip success I'm your music